kind of weird coming up here and talking on a mic. There's not that many here, but I'll do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're going to show our, our second video here, um, which is um, doesn't really build on off the first video, but they kind of build off of each other. Uh, this second video uh, is a little bit more on, on some of the ecological um, side of the work that we're doing. Uh, and a little bit less on the on some of the cultural stuff that we discussed in the last film. Uh, I just wanted to start by just mentioning why we actually created these videos. So um, back when we started thinking about some of the work that uh, we were going to do, uh, we heard from the membership about what kinds of work that they wanted us to embark on and and uh, do some research and, and come back to membership. One of the first things we were thinking about was um, communication, um, and specifically communication back to membership. So if membership is asking us to do this work, uh, it was critical that we bring that uh, research back to the membership um, along with the, this idea of involving membership all the way along and guiding us along the way. Um, and of course, being uh, scientists and so on, we, we, we do try and publish our work uh, with the purpose of publishing being um, establishing uh, the record on uh, what we have learned. And that helps us um, if we're um, in negotiations with the colonial government, uh, it helps us with um, kind of pushing some of San's interests. But it's not very helpful for communicating our work back to membership. They're not overly interested in reading an academic journal article. And I don't blame them. So for that reason, we wanted to, we actually put in, when we put in for our grants, we were thinking about that idea of communicating. And we, came up with this idea of creating these documentaries um, to share that information back in a way that uh, we thought that people might appreciate a little bit more. So that was really the reason why we kind of uh, did these documentaries. So anyway, we'll uh, go into the second documentary and then uh, we were hoping to have a bit of a discussion. Um, I know back, uh, back at NAWASH when we have meetings, we try and really limit the amount of stuff that we're presenting to be very short because we'd much rather sit around in a circle and uh, all have a discussion with each other than have somebody stand up at the front and uh, drone on and on and on and on and on and everyone falls asleep. So with that, we'll uh, get into the uh, vi next video. As a nation, the fishing islands were, were a big part of what, what held the nation together. Everybody fished before uh, the colonial system started to, to roll in. The fish were who we are. <laughs> it, it, you, you, can't, you couldn't uh, depict one from the other. It, it was survival. It was um, trade and commerce, it, it was everything. The fish were everything. The Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, or SON, and the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, more commonly known as the MNRF, have a long history that was characterized by conflict and disagreement regarding issues related to the fisheries in Lake Huron. 
Paul Jones from the Chippewas and Nawash, Nia Shingnaming, Gonjiba, and I'm a fisherman, commercial fisherman. Have been for about 30 years or more anyway. I was an iron worker by trade, so when I came home back from out working iron, I, the ministry imposed a ban on the Chippewas and Nawash to, from selling, so I went, got a boat and some nets and went just to say, I don't think you have the right to charge us, so because we never give it up. We never gave up the fishery, so all the treaties and whatever transpired, we never ever give up our right to fish and hunt. So why would you give away your, what you're putting food on the table with? So that was a kind of belief I always had, and that's the belief I got off my ancestors, and that's the belief I passed down today, is that we still never gave it up. In the past, Son was excluded from most decisions about fisheries management, including fish stocking, and were not invited to participate in research conducted by bi-national management agencies in the Great Lakes Basin. The relationship between MNRF and the Son can generally be categorized into three time periods. One, fisheries-related conflict pre-2000. Two, the transition to joint fishery governance from 2000 to 2018. And lastly, the third period, which is today, where SON and the MNRF are jointly doing research using a new method of a tuptamuk or two-eyed seeing. Mi'kmaq elder Albert Marshall describes the process as learning to see from one eye with the strengths of Indigenous knowledges and ways of knowing, and from the other eye with the strengths of mainstream knowledges and ways of knowing, and to use these eyes together for the benefit of all. The purpose of this research project is to determine whether lake trout are contributing to recent declines in lake whitefish. The two objectives of the research are to determine if lake trout predation is a significant factor on lake whitefish and to determine whether there is potential for resource competition between the two species. Ani Sydney Najwan Dijnakaz Nia Shingdeming Donchaba Chichak and Dodem. So my name is Sydney Najwan and uh, I live here in Nia Shingdeming and, and have my whole life. And my dotum is a crane. And the, the dotum of the, the people sort of define who you are or what your purpose is. And so uh, being chichak or crane is, um, is to get all the information, to gather the information and, and to make better decisions overall. So that has been our, our place in the community for forever. Our family uh, moved from uh, Nawash in Own Sound back in 18, well, uh, 1857, I believe. The, uh, the surrender was 1854. My grandfather, he as a child actually grew up just right up near um, Hope Bay. The nation is made up between Zoggy and Daywash, and there wasn't a fishery until the colonial system came into play. And, and then once the colonial system came into play, it, it turned into, um, you would say, leasing um, sections of water and islands and, and whatnot. So, so the, the colonials coming in uh, were all trying to get a piece of the action. They had to feed their families also. So the, the fish were just an invaluable source uh, for, for everybody. My name is Aubrey Erbshot, 18 years old. Um, indigenous. I'm from Neoshingaming Reserve. My grandpa's a fisherman. Um, I'm pretty sure his brothers are fishermen too. Um, my mom used to tell me stories about how she would go out with him on the boat and um, all of my aunts would go with him and that's how they learned how to fish, gut a fish too. My mom was pretty impressed when I first learned how to gut my fish because she remembers doing it with my papa when she was younger. My name is Erin Dunlop. I'm a research scientist with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. 
Um, I work out of Trent University um, with the aquatic research section of MNRF. I'm supervising a master's student, uh, Courtney Taylor, um, that's working on the Western science uh, component of the two-eyed seeing project. I first uh, started working with Sawn uh, back in 2018 um, and it was actually Sawn that approached us, the, the ministry and myself, uh, when they saw a call for research proposals by the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. Uh, so Sawn was interested in potentially doing uh, a project with us and, and putting in a, a research proposal uh, to seek some funding. Um, and really what kind of brought us together uh, was the declines in Lake Whitefish that are occurring in Lake Huron, um, including in uh, Sans traditional territory. Basically at the heart of this study is looking at whether there are, um, whether lake trout are contributing to the declines in Lake Whitefish. Sawn harvesters were noting that um, they were seeing lake whitefish in the stomachs of, of larger lake trout. And so this raised concerns in the community that potentially lake trout were causing the declines of lake whitefish. The other um, part of what we're looking at with our Western science component of the two-eyed seeing research study is um, we're measuring something called stable isotopes from uh, fish scales that are collected in Lake Huron. Because this is a two-eyed seeing research study, um, we also have the indigenous knowledge component of the project. And that's where knowledge holders in the Sawn community, including harvesters, elders, other, other community members, are being interviewed and, and asked about changes that they've seen um, in the lake um, with respect to, you know, where fish are living, what they're eating, um, in order to um, further understand you know, the extent to which um, lake trout might be contributing to the declines of whitefish. Hello, my name is Alexander Duncan. Uh, my spirit name is Sound of Coming Thunder. I'm a member of the Martin clan, and my home community is here, the Chippewas of Nawash, unceded First Nation. Following my master's degree at Lakehead University, uh, I began working for the fisheries program here again as a research coordinator in 2020, um, where I stayed for about a year until I left to do my, uh, my doctorate, what I'm doing now. I, I would say there's a number of issues facing the song fishery. Um, like all small scale fisheries, a, a lot of our folks are, are getting older and there's not a lot of youth really jumping into the fishery. Uh, for a number of different reasons, uh, I think maybe a disconnect from culture, um, a disconnect from the way we used to do things, but then there's also uh, significant upfront costs to operating in a commercial fishery, you know. So that's one issue, I think. Um, another large issue would be the numerous invasive species in the territory and non-native species. So we've witnessed large impacts from sea lamprey, which parasitized and, and took out a lot of our fish in the middle of the 1900s. Um, there are a variety of other invasive species and uh, presently a lot of local sports clubs, uh, sports fishing clubs and uh, the province stock non-native fish in our waters. So a number of different types of salmon, some trouts. Um, they, they used to stock lake trout rehabilitatively in the area um, and lake trout are technically native fish but the strains that they were using were not native and they just this compounded interaction with all of these non-native fish on our native fish was really tough. So uh, there's been declines, uh, pretty serious declines in a number of, of native fish species. So already with our fish harvesters, you know, they, they're on the water every day. So they, they're witnessing changes throughout their own lifetime. But then we have this sort of multi-generational knowledge where they're hearing stories from their fathers and uncles um, and aunts and, and family. So it's really important that uh, we're working on figuring out why lake whitefish are declining and how we might be able to help them. One of the real strengths of SON knowledge is that this is knowledge that has been passed down through many, many generations. And it includes knowledge that uh, goes so far back into history uh, so that kind of information is incredibly uh, interesting and valuable. So 
there's that strength that we bring with sod knowledge. There's also that close relationship between the knowledge holders and the waters, which creates this really strong understanding about what is going on out in the lake. And so if we look at the information that is uh, contained within saw, the saw knowledge system, and then also take a look at the knowledge that we hold through the strong Western science approaches, which tend to be kind of reductionist, less holistic, but very powerful in um, ways of trying to understand certain components of what's going on in the ecosystem. For example, our use of the isotope study or the use of uh, stomach content analysis, for example. So if we take a look and understand um, more about what's going on from the Western science perspective through those techniques, as well as what is understood through the SAW knowledge holders and the SAW knowledge system, then we gain such a powerful way of understanding what is going on out in Lake Huron and Georgia Bay. To facilitate the sharing of knowledge in this two-eyed seeing process, researchers have adopted what is called the conversation method. The method is harmonious with Indigenous culture, given its roots are in oral traditions and storytelling. This is crucial in order to have inclusive and productive engagement in the academic world, which has become a growing theme in many research environments. The contemporary academic institution often operates within colonial agendas and has historically seldom made space for the inclusion or legitimization of differing ontologies and ways of knowing. Too often, best practices when working with Indigenous communities are regarded as checklists, stripping nuance of situations and not truly making sure that the outcomes of a project are best suited for all those involved. For the Anishinaabe of the Great Lakes, the pipe ceremony is a cultural cornerstone that recognizes and give thanks for all of creation, often preceding other specific ceremonies and protocols. Having come together to find shared and meaningful goals in saving whitefish from further decline, Son and the Ministry laid the foundation to building a legitimate, mutually beneficial, and equitable partnership. The, the, the Son has always fished uh, just, just about all the different types we have and they were all used for different um, commodities or, or whatever. First it would start out in very early spring as soon as the ice left the harbor we would be down at the harbor and catching rainbow and that would last for maybe a week or two and then you would see the, um, the white fish come in, start coming into the harbor. Once the whitefish started to come, then the herring were a, a mixture of that. You were always looking forward to the next different type of fish uh, coming into, they didn't come into season exactly, but they came in a, in a specific order, uh, I guess due to food source, water temperature, Another facet of research being conducted is the investigation into lake trout and lake whitefish stomach content. So when a fish is collected in the field, um, the stomach of that fish is removed. So these are fish that come from harvesters um, and they've come from all different parts of the lake where um, m and and our partners are doing different uh, sampling surveys. So these fish stomachs are placed in their own uh, unique sample bag um, and then they're brought back to the lab and placed in the freezer. At a later date, um, the samples are removed from the freezer um, and typically they're thawed overnight. Um, and then the crew comes in in the morning and removes the stomach from the sample bag um, and they weigh that stomach with all of its contents. They then open up the stomach um, and basically look at what's inside. Um, so here they identify individual prey items um, so some of the prey items are more digested and, and uh, difficult to identify, um, and the crew just does the best that they can. So sometimes you might only be able to identify that it's a fish, and other times you're able to identify that fish right down to the species level. So they take each of these prey items um, and they measure them um, and they weigh them as well. 
They also look at whether these stomachs are empty, because um, that can also tell us some important information, you know, whether these fish are, are sort of having full stomachs or not getting enough to eat. Um, and once the, all of the prey items are removed from the stomachs, the stomach is weighed again. Um, so we have um, the, the biomass of the contents within the stomachs. Um, so that can give us a sense of how much prey um, and the, the weight of these prey items that these fish are eating to give us a sense of how much energy the fish are actually deriving from, from the different prey groups. The idea is to understand more about what's going on within the food chain out in Lake Huron and Georgia Bay. There's a lot of concerns about what the changes that are going on in the lake and the effects that that is having on the organisms that are out there trying to um, survive. And one of those key uh, questions is about diet and what these, uh, in our case, what whitefish and lake trout are eating. And there have been a lot of concerns that have come from community members about the effect of stocked lake trout on lake whitefish. And the, it seems like it's those larger lake trout that, um, that the fishers are cutting open and finding those large lake whitefish in. Researchers have also been gathering samples of scales off these fish in order to determine the isotopic composition or what the scales are made up of on an atomic level. So for our project, we are looking at the stable isotope ratios from scales collected for lake trout and lake whitefish. So when we sample a fish um, out on the lake in the field, we remove some of the scales from the fish. Um, so these are fish collected by harvesters um, and by our crews out conducting uh, their monitoring programs on the lake. So we take these scales um, and we put them into a scale envelope where we record other information about the fish, um, such as the length of the fish um, and where it was captured. We then take these scale envelopes back to the lab um, and that's where um, later we process them for stable isotopes. So what we do is we take these scale envelopes out, we take the scales out, we soak them in water overnight. Um, we then carefully sort of wipe off any uh, debris or dirt on the scales so that they're nice and clean. Um, we then dry these scales in a drying oven after which time we take the scales and we punch out the first two growth rings on the scales. Um, so much like rings on a tree, um, scales form annual growth rings. So the scale is growing along with the fish. Um, and so we don't want to include the first two years in our stable isotope analysis because the fish are eating very different things when they're sort of so small and tiny. Um, and our project, we're just focusing on the isotopes for the juveniles and adults. Um, so we take these scale samples with the centers um, punched out um, and we weigh them and put them in these small little tin cups. Um, and these tin cups are then shipped off to uh, a specialized lab um, that actually does the stable isotope analysis for us. Um, so with that, we're specifically looking at carbon-13 and nitrogen-15 stable isotope ratios. So with the stomach content analysis, you get a snapshot view of what that fish was eating over the last day or so. But with stable isotopes, um, when we look at stable isotopes from the scale samples especially, what we're getting is an integrated look at the fish's diet over the course of its life. So these two pieces of information, the information coming from the stomach contents and the information coming from the stable isotopes, they kind of tell you different things, but they're very complementary. Um, so when we combine that with the Indigenous ecological knowledge interviews with SON members, this becomes a pretty powerful approach um, for really understanding um, the interactions between lake trout and lake whitefish. You know, um, if you saw an, uh, a Ministry of Natural Resources truck or car come into the, the community, there would be a lot of issues with that, um, just given the past history, but uh, their commitment to work meaningfully and engage with us um, in a more ethical manner has really has really changed. And in, in, uh, in my professional experience, however many years I've, I've been doing it, um, it, it's really great to see, you know. To continue to be successful, we need elders and fish harvesters perspectives. 
because they're out on the water doing the work, seeing what's out there, but then also the fisheries office who has other partners in work looking at the Western science perspective. I feel like if you're just getting one perspective, that's not, that's not getting enough because like Western science, like they don't know our waters like our fishermen do or like our elders do. They don't know the community like our elders do. So like I said, when you bring both together, it creates something even, even bigger, even better. Although Indigenous Ecological Knowledge, or IEK, has been applied in fisheries research before, the applications of a two-eyed seeing approach are limited, despite the numerous Indigenous fisheries in the Great Lakes. However, recent and ongoing work across Canada can provide insight into developing this process. One example is a paw to maw to look a collaborative study among Mi'kmaq knowledge holders, local harvesters, academic researchers, and government scientists in the Bay of Fundy and Verdor Lake in Nova Scotia. A two-eyed seeing approach can also be used to inform decision-making when data is incomplete or lacking, particularly at the local level. For example, it was revealed in a study conducted in British Columbia that local population declines in Dungeness crab went undetected by managers at regional scales, but was finally caught by combining IEK with simulation modeling in the absence of available fisheries independent data. Although there isn't many instances of this process being used within the Great Lakes, there is still hope for that to change going forward. All I can say is that we hope for the best, but hope and reality are, are two different ends of the scale. And I don't know if there's any meeting in the middle uh, with that. People will continue to fish if, if there's fish to be caught. I have no doubt about that. Um, because of the decline in the white fish, we lost a, a number of fishermen, but it's in our blood to, to keep fishing. I think this collaboration mostly came about over the immediacy of the lake whitefish declines. You know, we're both working on similar things, us in the province, and uh, I think from a logical standpoint, it just made sense. Right now in fisheries too, there's this large push towards better collaborations, more ethical engagement. So some of what we're learning in this project so far is basically that lake trout and lake whitefish do interact. So coming into this project, uh, I would say there was really a lot of skepticism um, about just the whole premise of our study and some of the concerns brought forward from the community that uh, lake trout and lake whitefish um, were interacting and that this could potentially be contributing to the declines of whitefish. And what we're seeing that is, is that it's the larger lake trout that have more uh, lake whitefish in their stomachs. And this is sort of, you know, similar to what the, the Sawn community members were telling us that, that they were seeing and sort of what led to this uh, work um, going forward in the first place. So using the two-eyed seeing approach, I think has been really valuable because it's allowed um, MNRF and so on to come together and do research in an equi equitable way that um, really allows us to trust each other um, and to learn from one another. We haven't been able to have this type of relationship before. And I think prior to using two-eyed seeing, we really operated in different silos um, and we weren't able to sort of freely come together and, and, share, and share what we were learning. I think as well, um, using a two-eyed seeing approach was important to SON because it allowed a way for us to really um, open up and, and listen to their concerns about Lake Whitefish um, and to have um, their knowledge valued on an equal playing field with Western science. Um, and so it's, it's been incredibly um, valuable for me to learn about all of the knowledge that Sawn has about Lake Whitefish and about the changes in the lake. I mean, they're out on the water, they're seeing things happening. Um, and so I've been so incredibly grateful um, for the knowledge um, that they have shared with us. And so I think there is some learning that needs to be done. Uh, and hopefully this type of project kind of demonstrates just how valuable two-eyed seeing can be and how it really will allow us to kind of work better with Indigenous communities and do this work in a good way. 
My name is Courtney Taylor. I'm a master's student at Trent University. I'm working on the Lake Trout and Lake Whitefish Interactions Project through the GLFC. The part of the project that I have uh, appreciated the most is the in-person opportunities to learn from members of the Indigenous community and the elders. And that's an experience that I won't get to have. Why do you think it has taken so long for this research collaboration to have taken place? Bullhead. <laughs> Everybody's got this, this preconceived knowledge. I, I that, that's how I um, kind of frame things. Everybody thinks, well, I, I know it better than the next guy, so what I say should go. And you don't have any collaboration between the groups to sit down and, and work through the problems, identify the problems, then figure out what, what can be done. So um, have we got all the answers? Probably not. You know, have they got all the answers? Probably not. But if we sat down and collaborated together a little bit, maybe we could find some reasonable solutions. Like I said, we finally, we finally got our foot in the door with the Great Lakes Commission. And um, both Alex and Ryan have done very well to, to uh, steer us in, in the, that right direction. It's, it's not new. We, we've been trying to do that for since, since the 90s. So it's, it's just a very slow process. Uh, politics, uh, people's views. So man is just doing it to himself. This is the, the reality. What I am doing is trying to document as much as I can that I know of my lifetime and plan on leaving that behind. Yeah, I just was thinking that uh, back when we have uh, meetings at uh, NAWASH, uh, we don't typically sit in this kind of format. And uh, I'm wondering if we could try something. Um, and perhaps we can uh, arrange the seats in a circle and everyone can then be on an equal footing and we can have a discussion. And we won't need a mic. Yeah, okay. Just say that again, right? Yes, so I want everybody to be very articulate in, uh, in expressing their views and thoughts. <laughs> no, I was just thinking that uh, we can pass the, the mic, mic around and uh, give people a chance to ask questions or, or um, share some of their own uh, I guess experiences or perspectives, and uh, we'll just pass the mic along. Um, at NAWA, sometimes uh, there will be a feather that gets passed around the room, and each person that has a feather then has the, the chance to talk. <laughs> uh, 
Kia ora tātou. Um, look, I came in a bit late, um, but uh, what I did see and, and get a chance to hear, really appreciate uh, what you guys have brought across and, and shared with us. Um, uh, very different, but then very much the same. Uh, and um, but uh, yeah, just I don't know. I don't know if I've watched too many movies or what, but just love the way you guys tell your stories, uh, and and love love listening to you. Um, uh, I, I don't, <coughs> I don't, I don't really have anything to to share. Um, I think, but uh, my 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 real area of interest uh, across the many uh, faces or, or facets of, of Tangaroa in, in the sea and the moana uh, is uh, more in the commercial uh, kind of space. Um, and uh, yeah, so just you know some of the some of the things that you guys are dealing with and. Uh, I think one of the one of the challenges or one of the things we've um, uh, we've lost a, a little bit uh, back here in Aotearoa is um, through the treaty fishery settlement. Uh, you know we we now the tribes are now big owners of quota uh, and those sorts of things. But uh, when it comes to actual fishes and boats and uh, our people being out on the water commercially fishing, uh, we've unfortunately lost a lot of that. Uh, and everything here in Aotearoa is, is very um, centralised. So we do have Māori fishing companies and those sorts of things, but it's very, um, yeah, it's very, it's very centralised. Uh, I think we're fortunate here in Tauranga Moana that we still do have some Fano that have managed to remain in commercial fishing. Uh, we have the Rolleston Farno uh, at, at, uh, at out at um, Mount Maunganui, uh, and they uh, fish pelagic uh, fisheries. Uh, we have uh, Roger Rawlinson here in Tauranga Moana, uh, who's a, a big commercial fisher. But they, that's fairly unique. Um, not not all of our coastal communities uh, have that uh, opportunity or that relationship in in. For some of our people, they don't want it. They don't want, don't want anything to do with commercial fishing, even if it is tribally owned. You know, and and, and that's the reality. That's the um, that's the world we live in, and that is just part of of our Maori world. That um, uh, we don't all see eye to eye, and there are some challenges that uh, you know for commercial tribal commercial fisheries that I think we just need to face up to. And, and need to address and, and deal with. Um, so that, that's just a little bit that's come out of what I've seen from your video and, and from your guys' call. Kia ora. Is, am I, was I on the right path or? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Passing on. I'm actually sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm very impressed with your two eye seeing because uh, a lot of times at the community level it's you and us but you've brought it so beautifully together that once you put up your logo okay everybody has to hold hands here and even uh, us going into our own villages coming in with the ngos or with undp they look at us as them so that is really nice my head is swimming. What part of the lobster are we going to use? You have a lovely eagle head. Okay, so that two eyes, the first time I'm seeing it. And uh, also, for the Fijians, still only 82% of the land. And um, a lot of, I mean, the fish in the Ngolingoli. We have not learned to fight for anything, so we have become passive and lazy. That's probably inappropriate for me to say about my people, but uh, we kind of laid back. And 
except in the rugby field, except not in the sevens right <laughs> now. So thank you very much for your beautiful logo. Um, I was, during, in the um, documentary, there was said that this um, conversation or this project has kind of come together in a way out of a, a lucky coincidence that you were interested in a thing and the university researchers or the um, government, the provincial government was interested in a thing. Um, and so it was kind of like this coincidence that brought the two parties together. And I was wondering if um, from this work, maybe if you've been able to kind of like push new things into an existence that 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 start with, or that that come with the same approach that kind of like bring two sides that maybe share the same interest um, together but they don't know it yet you know that it's it's a little bit more um, more directed this interaction rather than a, a coincidence um, oh. oh sorry <laughs> Yeah, if if the video gave an impression, uh, the impression that it was a coincidence, um, I don't know if that's completely accurate. I, I think that um, we spent a lot of work actually um, talking together and um, trying to figure out where we might have some common interests, and um, and then working together on some of those in those areas like the decline in, in Dickamag where we do have uh, those common uh, interests. And um, if you don't know, uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources and the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation are long-term enemies. And I don't use that term lightly. Um, enemies. Um, fighting for many, many, many years. Um, when I think about uh, Sidney Najwan, the elder in this film, uh, he talks about how the um, Ministry of Natural Resources would uh, sit on the edge of the uh, reserve waiting for uh, people going in to buy fish, and they would uh, catch those people and find them. Um, or uh, thinking about elders, uh, talking about when they were kids and they were trying to um, go out on the river and catch fish to eat and they would be getting chased by the um, uh, Ministry of Natural Resources to charge them or, um, or um, fine them. Um, so uh, there was a lot of uh, a long history that wasn't a very good history. Um, and so it wasn't an easy thing to work together. Um, and it was really only by fa finding those common interests and trying to work together to on some of those things that we've made any progress at all. Um, we still fight. Um, there's still lots of disputes and, and uh, that kind of thing. But we have started to make some steps forward because in some areas we've been able to find uh, these little places where we both uh, have the same interest. I don't. I think everyone in this situation wants to see Dickamag uh, not disappear from the lakes. So that's so really that common goal. I think that brought us together. Um, there's there's other areas I think as well that we'll be able to find those common goals. Um, but if we don't have those common interests, I think it'd be very difficult to make progress. You you really have to have um, willingness on either side. Um, sorry, I'm getting a little long-winded, but just one more little thing. Um, it's not only that, but uh, just thinking about um, you have to take risks. When I think about um, uh, Ogama or Chief um, Najwan, um, the Ministry of Natural Resources a long time ago were banned from coming into the Chippewas of Nawash. They're not allowed to come in. Um, and uh, it was Chief Najwan, the Ogama, that uh, kind of took a bit of a risk and, and allowed the ministry to come in so that we could start working together. Um, and the same on the Ministry of Natural Resources. Um, 
they never really liked the um, idea that um, Saad started to get some of those rights and some of that jurisdiction back. So they had to take a bit of a, a risk as well to uh, kind of reach out and work together. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a little bit of risk taking and a little bit of, uh, you know, placing some trust where there really weren't many foundations to build on and also uh, working towards a common goal. So anyway, sorry for that long winded answer, but that's, I hope that answered your question. We are still using that method in research. So there's some other research projects we have on the go and that are being initiated now where we're, we were intentionally using it before, but we're continuing to intentionally use it in the future for other stuff. So it's, we're, it's, it's still in action. Uh, kia ora koutou, ko Megan Aho. Um, firstly, an amazing presentation, thank you. Um, I really loved your 2 IC framework, um, particularly for me and my research that I'm doing, trying to navigate those two worlds, in our case, te ao Māori and te ao Pākehā, I find as, as a, I guess, early career researcher quite challenging. So. I've actually referenced your 2 i seeing framework. I really appreciate it, yeah. <laughs> and it's really nice to see it on the ground in a pragmatic way, actually applied to a place and to people. Um, I think that's really important that it doesn't just kind of sit up here, but it's actually on the ground um, being put in action. So yeah, I just want to acknowledge that and I appreciate um, the framework that you guys have created or those who have created it. Um, one of the questions I had was what do you hope what what do you hope in terms of what's come out of this research? Where do you hope that that like what do you do with that those findings that you have gathered? Back to you, Ryan. Sure. Uh oh. Here you go. Oh, I'll keep it short winded. I believe that uh, out of this research that we've seen so far, is it's actually starting to go more towards putting a moratorium on the stocking of sports fish. And the, in saying that, I know that we're not going to completely stop it, but we're going to, we're hopefully on the road to slowing it down and putting that moratorium on so that it gives those chance f of those fish to come back, those native species. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take years and generations to come back to the point of where it was at one point. But uh, I think the overall point is, is that we're slowly starting to come together and starting to understand uh, the decline in, 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 the, in the whitefish. And through our history and, and our oral teachings, it, it's showing, it, it's proving it. And I think that's the biggest uh, point. Yeah, on that last point, I think um, this whole process has really shown the province and some of these other government agencies that this knowledge is valid. Um, you know, you talk to some scientists and they kind of, pff, like this is just anecdotal evidence, like you guys don't know what you're talking about, but through this we've been able to, like hey, like what we said, we found through Western science methods. So I think that's been pretty nice, uh, feels good. And uh, I don't know if you wanna say anything, Ryan? <laughs> um, the, the findings from this research, we're using it for uh, a rehabilitative project to do stuff about the declining whitefish, whether that be rehabilitative stocking or some habitat restoration or, or what have you. And we're just in the early stages of setting that up. You can pass it. You don't have to say anything. <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> um, yeah, really just wanted to, thanks, um, to thank you for showing such um, an example of social ecological research approach. Um, I think it's it's getting more and more important to to get these questions through the social ecological approach and I think 
uh, one of one of the Im most important thing or one of the most interesting thing that I ca I got from from the documentary was how you you listen to to the fishermen and and identify those areas that were impacted and you decided to run to do uh, underwater survey over there even if we didn't have any any data before and i think this is really interesting because um it's an example of uh how the um, ecological knowledge the traditional ecological knowledge complement the lack of scientific knowledge um i've been working with uh, Small scale fisheries, um, or s some f some fishermen in um, in Spain, in Europe, in Barcelona in particular, and it's it has been really interested interesting for me to see how their knowledge were actually was actually important for us um, as a as a scientist um, to to complement the knowledge that we didn't have in particular on um, the abundance of some species um, and this helped to include their, their view, their perspective into uh, the fish stock assessments and, and then yeah this was interesting because um, in the end our, our results show that there's no difference between the stock assessment results and, and the fishery and the fisherman perspective. Um, so one, one question I had, um, it was related to the timeline you showed. So during the, um, at the early 2000, you, you find out about the, um, the, the, the problems that were, you were facing and in 2018, you started to engage with the with the community. Uh, I was wondering how this engagement process actually occurred, because for me in uh, in Spain it was a little bit hard to to engage with small scale fishermen. Um, so in the future, I would like to to have some more skills or um, uh, knowledge about how to ask for. Uh, information to explore their knowledge and um, and yeah again thanks for for your work uh, one thing I think that's been helpful we're fairly embedded within the community we have an office across the road from the school and even in my own work when I'm doing work with different First Nations outside of our own what I think the the number one thing to do is just to spend time in the community with no agenda just be honest, open yourself, hang out, go to feast, engage in the whatever sort of events they have in the area, hang out, you know? Um, and I found that super helpful just to get to know people on a personal level and then you build that rapport, that trust, that relationship. And a lot of the work we do is based on this idea of relationality and reciprocity. You know, if someone gives you something, you're meant to give something back. Um, and we have some cultural teachings about that as well. I don't. Know if Ryan or Nick wants to talk about how we. S okay, Nick. There you go. We have all the time in the world. <laughs> we sure do. Our ancestors <laughs> taught us that. <laughs> You're asking about engagement with the, the fishermen. Um, when we first started doing this type of work in our community, our fishermen would come together and it would. Um, it wasn't easy. Our fishermen, some of our meetings would actually come fisticuffs, trying to understand what we were doing as a community, people thinking that we're infringing on their rights. We're trying to protect our, our, our lineage and our heritage and our tradition and thinking ahead of seven generations. One thing that always brings people together food <laughs> we always have food at our meetings and we always try to start off in, in ceremony and in a good way and we share food and we have conversation and knowledge sharing and that has gone a long way in our community uh, as fishermen as community leaders and thinking ahead to the next 
the next generations that are coming up. I'll, I'll leave it at that because I don't want to. Uh, I want to make sure that everybody has a chance to be able to speak. Yeah, and the, the talk yesterday, you're talking about the why of things, like why why are we doing this work? We asked people in our community what work they want to be done, and that's really drove what what we're doing here. Um, we're, <laughs> we're like a tool, um, not in like the jokey way. We're not a bunch of tools, but we're a means to an end. We're a, a tool that the community can use to answer their questions and concerns and find solutions. So I like to think of it that way. It's kind of funny sometimes. Um, you good, Ryan? I was just thinking that you're asking, I guess just, just on a practical level um, with what you're asking, um, discussions like we're having right now, sitting in this circle, that's, that's what we do. Um, uh, we also have one-on-one -on -one, uh, discussions. Uh, fishers are actively engaged. They come by, like Alex said, they drop by our office and they speak their mind. <laughs> and uh, whether you want to hear it or not, they're going to let us know. <laughs> Uh, as Nick said, uh, it wasn't easy. Um, we've had the fisticuffs at our meetings initially, but as time has gone on, um, we've built trust. Uh, it took years. It wasn't something we could do. Uh, it didn't take one year. It didn't take two years. It didn't take three years. It took a lot of years to get to where we are today. That's the, re that's the reality. So I don't know how helpful that is to you, but hopefully you could pick a few things out of that. <laughs> Another thing too with buy-in from community members, I, I, I think they appreciate having young indigenous folks involved in the work. So in the documentaries, we had my little cousin Aubrey and my little sister Ruth and myself as well. And having the people from the nation do the work, like doing the interviews, talking with people, I think that goes a long way. So yeah, do we answer your question? All right. Kia ora Chris Ahu. Um, I've been a, a very fortunate person uh, in that I've managed to live uh, lots, lots and lots of lives uh, through different people's eyes. Uh, I was brought up in a part of South Auckland that was mostly a Pacific community. Um, so as a kid, yeah, I went out with um, my best friends who are mostly Noans and Samoans. Uh, I've managed to spend uh, 12 years in, in Australia, mostly in the northern parts, uh, Torres Strait, um, Arnhem Land, far north Queensland, and then extremely fortunate to, to arrive here for the last uh, 13 years amongst whānau uh, here, and uh, through their eyes I've learnt a lot. And the, the message through all of those places is the uh, complexity, uh, the interconnectedness, uh, not only between land and sea, but with, within the moana. Um, and also, um, I've noticed this uh, increasing, uh, continuing story with Western science. It's an interesting term, Western science, actually, because I'm sure all the Eastern countries where a lot of algebra and stuff came from originally, I think that's a bit odd. But anyway, um, the more traditional science that people are thinking of uh, is, and uh, it was uh, up on the screen this morning, very reductionist. And uh, they only attack uh, a couple of the protagonists of a particular problem. So in the Great Barrier Reef, for instance, it's coral bleaching, and there's a question, well, will sponges take over? And I only looked at corals and sponges, and they forgot about all the other things. Uh, here, uh, I've learnt, actually, you know, through Rion's uh, teachings, uh, through Haoreti, um, the, the question of kina um, overtaking um, the reefs and eating all of the seaweeds, and the protagonists there are potentially crayfish and snapper that are less abundant, so the kinners get away. Um, but they're forgetting about all of the other things down there, uh, the, as Howard calls them, the gardeners. And these are also missing. Uh, these are things like moki and pori, um, blue cod and goatfish that are always working on the bottom uh, and interacting with all the other things that are there. So uh, th the question is um, uh, to you uh, after all of this is, how do you get around um, making those who fund that type of science, uh, the Western funders, to understand and appreciate the complexity of the interactions that you will know about and no one else does in your rohi, in, in, in your country? Uh, when the funding systems that will, will generate these things will often just want 
to work on just a couple of protagonists. And I notice you're looking at trout and whitefish, but you will undoubtedly know about all of the other things that the whitefish have interacted with. Uh, looking at their mouths, they're bottom feeders, right? They, yep. So, you know, what I, I guess the question is, what do you know that's missing? And are you having trouble in communicating that to scientists who will go out and try and get the funding, and ideally jointly, because it is complex and they want a simple way of funding something? I'm not sure I'm explaining myself very well, but it's imparting that complexity, but importantly, um, having those who can give you the resources to work on it, who can listen and actually understand that complexity. I believe as, uh, as a First Nation, um, from our own community standpoint, that uh, as we go through this, we're fortunate to have my nephew and Ryan that are very smart and have those PhDs and those uh, uh, professorships or masters or whatever um, to be able to talk to them about what it is that we're seeing and for them to be able to put it on paper in a way that will go to funders and organizations to be able to help and work and work side by side. Um, this this collaboration that's happened here with Parks Canada and the Ministry, that wasn't just an overnight conversation. That was probably three years or four years in the making almost. Oh, yeah, several years. <laughs> yeah, but to the, to the funding point of it, it was it was still like that length of time but it was because we had to literally sit at the table we had to have those you know uncomfortable conversations with them to be able to get our message through and and have the fishermen the when the ministry came up and they had a meeting with the with the fishermen and the and the ministry actually heard what our fishermen were saying not just uh, us as a governance level but as a fisherman and they heard 25 to 30 of them all saying the same thing. The light bulbs started seem to be seem to start going off one by one um, for them to be able to listen to Ryan and Alex as to what we were saying. I, I heard one time, if you're not squirming, you're not learning. So definitely a lot of uncomfortable conversations. And I think in Canada, there's this huge push for indigenous research. We have three federal funding agencies. Um, there's a natural science one, a social science, and a health science one, and there's a big push, but it is difficult to show that this is important work. Um, and it's more performatory, I think, these f federal funding agencies just to say, hey, we're doing work with Native people, look at us sort of deal, we're doing a good thing. But um, in those federal funding agencies, First Nations aren't eligible entities to hold the funding, it's just universities. And it's, <laughs> you know, they're, they're saying one thing, but they're doing something else, which is really rough. And then. Ryan, hopefully, maybe you can talk about the Great Lakes Fishery Commission funding and the delegation and, and whatnot and that stuff. Yeah. So uh, I'll give you an example to your question. Um, I'm thinking back to uh, this project where we're trying to look at uh, interactions between lake whitefish and lake trout. Um, and when we're thinking about uh, a two-eyed seeing approach, um, on the Western side of things, the Western science, it was um, reductionist. We're looking at, uh, in some ways, we're looking at fish diet. We're looking at, um, we're looking at stable isotopes. But on the, the beauty of the um, saw knowledge side of things is that it is a holistic approach uh, from the very get go, and it does look at things more from that holistic. Um, approach as to what's going on and our interviews um, kind of expressed more of that holistic side of things. Um, when we approached the funder at the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission, um, it had to go to the research board, which are a bunch of, uh, uh, we'll call it Western scientists, um, that evaluate these proposals. And when they saw this two-eyed seeing approach, they did not understand it at all. 
and they had all kinds of questions and it didn't get accepted for funding. Um, there were a lot of questions um, that emerged um, and we had to painfully go through and, uh, and reply to all these questions that uh, the Western scientists had. Uh, for example, what happens if uh, Western science says one thing and the uh, knowledge holders are saying something else? What are we going to do about that? Um, that's no problem. It's okay. We don't always have to say the same thing. Uh, if we're saying different things, perhaps that's a time when we can learn and uh, try and figure out why we might be uh, seeing different perspectives. So it's not, not a bad thing. It's, it could be uh, good. Um, so uh, to answer your question, it's not easy. Um, there's still a long ways to go to get to a place where uh, this, these kinds of approaches and th those kind of complexities are accepted uh, within uh, grants and all the rest of it. So we have a long ways to go yet. Um, it took a lot of uh, backwards and forwards. And we, it took us a couple of years to work through that. Um, and actually this summer, as a result, um, the chiefs and councils of the um, Saugeen Ojibwe Nation invited that research board to come to Nawash and Saugeen and learn about um, the uh, traditional uh, indigenous knowledge side of things because there were so many misconceptions, uh, the leadership decided that the best thing to do was to have these people come onto the territory and learn so that maybe next time things won't be so uh, complicated and there won't be so many questions. So that's kind of where we ended up anyway, but uh, there's a long ways to go yet. Yeah, and that was the one of the first times they've seen a project scoped like that using indigenous knowledge and this funding body is a major driver of science in the Great Lakes which informs governance and management so uh, we're lucky to be the people to help show them the way but it's it's 2024 um, it's, it's pretty late to be learning stuff like that but we're happy to teach regardless so um, we'll pass it on to the next person and you're welcome to ask us any sorts of questions doesn't have to be about research about our territory, about our animals, about our fish, whatever you think. Thank you. Kia ora everyone. Um, ko hani o sana hau, uh, nauri tēnei mō te ahiwaru. Um, I guess I don't have any questions, um, but one thing that did stick out with me, I wrote it down. Um, one thing that was, I think it was inside the presentation, but somebody mentioned, as long as there are fish to be caught, we will fish. And the reason that stuck with me is because, sorry, um, I seen recently on one of those Save the Planet ads, um, the future generations fishing up fish and gutting them, but gutting out plastic inside of their stomachs, but still eating the fish. And the reason why that stuck with me is just I just thought, well, how is that going to be for my my kids and the generations that are to come? Um, and also just, it's just beautiful to see that, or not beautiful, but it's humbling to see that we all have the same problems. <laughs> um, and yeah, and also one thing I found interesting was uh, you can tell a fish's age through its scales. I really didn't know that. That was really interesting. Um, I guess, um, sorry, just a long three days. Um, one thing that was also cool to me is the youth over in your guys' rohe or territory is the interest and passion that they show for their papakainga and how, how badly they want to help restore it. It's just inspiring to me as a youth myself. Yeah. Kia ora, ngā mihi. <laughs> um, kia ora tātou. Ko te maere Hoskins tōku ingoa heri tēnei nō te taitokero. Um, 
again, thank you very much for sharing your kōrero with us. Um, I work for Te Ohu Kaimana, so that is working in the fisheries and ocean space with our iwi, with our tribes. Um, so I was interested in how your commercial fishing regime works over there. Um, if you could talk a little bit about that, that would be awesome. And I was also interested in um, how you guys conducted your research um, with your members to gain the ecological or well, indigenous knowledges that informed your rangaho, your research. Um, what did that look like? What did that entail? And how did you kind of bring all of the learnings together to inform what you do in the science world? If that makes sense. Kia ora. Those are two awesome questions. Uh, for the commercial question, I'll pass it over to Ryan, our resident fish biologist. Yeah, that's uh, how does the commercial fishery operate? Was that the question? Um, so at the moment, it operates through a uh, an agreement with the province. So there is a, a written agreement. It is public. So if you're interested, uh, you can look up the Saugin Ojibwe Nation Substantive Commercial Fishing Agreement, and you can learn a little bit more about uh, what that looks like. But essentially, uh, in a nutshell, what that means is that um, it's in many ways a co a co management agreement, uh, and it only applies to the commercial fishery. Uh, the right to fish for food and for ceremony uh, has nothing to do with commercial fishing, and it's not. Um, there's no quota for that kind of uh, what you I think you call customary fishing, perhaps. Um, and as I spoke earlier, that's kind of uh, that's covered more under the treaties uh, that uh, the Saugin Ojibwe Nation have with those fish beings. That's not nothing to do with the uh, colonial government. Um, so with the colonial government and the, uh, the commercial fishery, we have this agreement, like I said, the substantive commercial fishing agreement. And in that agreement, we have certain obligations and the Ministry of Natural Resources a province uh, represented the crown essentially also has certain obligations um, and the obligations that um, that sod have are to um, share the information that we're getting about the fishery so that's what my staff do we go out and we collect data on the amount of fish that are being taken we take s scale samples and stomachs and all the rest of it you saw uh, my field crew on the it, on the truck there all working away with the fish. So that's all information that we share as part of that uh, commercial fishing agreement uh, with the province. Um, and in return, uh, we get a small amount of funding from the province to carry out some of our work. Um, as far as uh, allocation of the fishery, so uh, the way it works is that um, Every year we have discussions about uh, what a sustainable harvest might look like. Um, and the amount of allocation is is broken up into a few different areas. And that's shared among all the fishers. It's a sh communal uh, type of fishery. It's not given to individual people. Um, and so if uh, you're a member of uh, the Chippewas of Niwash Unceded First Nation or um, the Chippewas of Saugeen First Nation. Um, you have that uh, ability to go out and um, catch fish out of that communal fishery. And um, once once the limit is, is kind of reached on that, then you just have to st stop fishing for the year. Uh, that being said, um, with all the things going on in the fishery. I won't get into all the kind of details of how that's kind of shifted, but um, yeah, that's, I think in a nutshell, that's kind of how the fishery operates, if that kind of makes sense. Um, and I think Alex wanted to answer, or Nick maybe wants to answer the second question, which I... 
Your question was about how we conduct the interviews. Okay, um, it's a it's a fairly standard interview. I mean, we sit down with a, a fisherman or a knowledge holder or someone from the community with a map and map out a series of locations based on a predetermined question list. It's pretty organic. It's not like question one, question two. They typically uh, go off track pretty fast. We end up talking about all sorts of stuff, and it's nice. It's just a nice time to hang out and chat about fish with uh, some of the knowledgeable people in our community. We have set honoraria rates, so this is determined by our, our leadership, I believe. It's usually around 250 Canadian dollars for each interview. There could be an offering of tobacco. In our culture, it's customary when you're asking for something, you give a gift of tobacco and a tobacco tie. Tobacco is one of our four sacred medicines. Um, and then there's the opportunity following the interview for the people who are interviewed to look over what they said and change anything or make any changes. Um, as far as putting that into the greater body of knowledge, we transcribe the interviews and digitize the maps. And with the maps, we'll make a whole series of different aggregate maps or specific maps based on a season or a location or what have you. And um, the transcripts are held um, on password protected computers and within the community. Um, we have research agreements with outside institutions if they're doing the in or if they're part of the interviews and we can be very selective in what we share with them based on what they're looking for and what we want to keep within the community. Um, and we have <laughs> tons of transcripts, lots of lots of information and it's lots of stories too. Like each of the features we mark on the map, there's usually a story or two associated with those. So it's it's a really rich source of knowledge and you know it includes all sorts of things. So it's I've had the pleasure of doing it in my own community and with other communities, and it's been, it's been really sweet. Um, does that sort of get out of your question? Yeah? Okay. Uh, we create a report out of that as well. So. Ryan just said we create a report out of that as well that we pass out to the community. And we'll have community meetings as well just to share the information in an informal setting, you know, with some food and some laughs and some door prizes. and. And usually when we have these community gatherings, they're opened with ceremony. So we'll start with a prayer, um, and then we'll often end with a prayer. Yeah. All right. Uh, kia ora tate. Haven't really got too much to say. I was a little bit blown away, to be honest. So what I'll say is, too Mickey. Too much, you fellas. Keep up the good work. You're doing some amazing stuff over there, and it's been inspirational to have you amongst us here. If I was to ask the question, I think I'd ask around some of the traditional fishing methods. What were some of the traditional ways that you caught fish, and are you still practicing those? Um, if and are you, we hold wānanga, uh, which is like many conferences with our kids and with our families and our our sub tribes, where we reclaim a lot of our traditional ways where we make old nets, we make like, fishing hooks and stuff like that. Do you fellows practice that stuff today? Uh, depending on where you are, um, some of our fishermen, fishers would uh, use what they call f fish weirs, and they, it would be a circle of uh, sticks set up, and almost like a minnow trap, if you want to call it that way. Um, and the fish would get trapped in there, and then the fishers would go and harvest them out of that. Um, some of the some of the older ones uh, still talk about seine netting, mm -hmm. and they are actually in the process of fixing one of the seines from 1963, re-getting the ropes redone on them, um, and reintroducing that to the young folks to be able to come down and be able to experience seine netting from the shore on those uh, nice east winds. Um, as well, I know that uh, Ryan and, and some of the others have taken into the school where they take fish into the school. The kids learn what type of fish it is. They learn how to scale it. They learn how to gut a fish. They learn how to fillet it. And, and they take it home to their mom and dad and to their families and... You know, it's their way of being able to utilize that fish in a good way and, and make sure that it doesn't go to waste. Um, some of our, our folks still practice eating 
um, when we're doing our fish and utilizing our fish, uh, we'll take the hearts and the livers and the throats and we'll fry them up. And that's like a delicacy for us uh, to be able to utilize all of that fish. And some of the elders say, we don't want any fish, we just want the fish heads. And they boil the fish heads down and, you know, they have that soup and uh, that broth and and we make fish pies and it's yeah. it's a wonderful thing like we try to utilize all of it and whatever we don't use um we try and put it into a compost mm -hmm. so that we can give back to mother nature on, on on the earth side of things as well as recognizing that without that uh, water being we don't have that life to be able to walk on with the trees and the earth and stuff mm -hmm. oh, um, some other methods too. Spearing is really big in our community. We have runs, migratory runs up rivers, so we have people going out and spearing. That's a yeah traditional practice. I'm pretty wicked with the spear. Um, <laughs> and uh, some of our older archaeological sites, you'll find old fish hooks, like wooden fish hooks, and then we we would fashion gill nets out of plant fibers as well back. So that's how we would seine. Or, or net fish, and um, we've run a couple initiatives with the school. Was that in the summer? Yeah. yeah, so we purchased a whole bunch of fishing rods and we had a fishing competition so the kids could go out and fish at the docks and send us pictures of their catch and win prizes and stuff, and we had a, a lot of little rug rats running around fishing, which was really cool to see. So I don't, I don't know if you have anything to add there, Rod, but. Oh, hey. Microphone, man. I, I was lucky enough uh, a number of years, uh, maybe five years ago now, uh, to go out with uh, Elder Vern Root, uh, who's passed now, but uh, he was a knowledge holder. And um, we went out to uh, Bears Rump Island, uh, which is a really special place uh, with a very, very uh, long history for sod fishing not many people go there so um, if you go out to this uh, spot uh, the old the fishing encampments from I uh, probably thousands of years ago are still all set up just like they were uh, back then um, and so you, if you uh, go to this fishing encampment there is piles of um, uh, net anchors that are made out of stone and they've been carved um, so that they could tie them onto the nets. Um, and there's, uh, if you look down the shoreline, the whole shoreline, it goes for so long and it's all these uh, pits that go like this. And those pits are where uh, the fish were smoked um, so that they could be stored. And um, uh, when we went with uh, Vernon Root, uh, we had a ceremony there uh, to celebrate that kind of that and recognize that that was such a special place and, and to uh, see the history there. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to share that little because it was something that for me really, really impacted me. Thanks. Yeah, okay. Uh, maybe why uh, he's getting that set up, we'll carry along here. Uh, kia ora, I'm Kirsty Woods. I used to work for Te Ohu Kaimwana, the organisation Tamari was just talking about, and I've retired from it now, but I haven't quite let go. Um, I just wanted to um, add to her question about the commercial fishery and also think about recreational fishers as well. Here, the way our commercial fisheries are managed, the, the iwi have a percentage of the overall quota, and the Minister of Fisheries sets the kind of commercial catch limit, so any cuts get shared by everybody. Um, and then the Minister also sets an allowance for the recreational fishing, which often gets exceeded. Um, and because the Minister makes these decisions, they become very political, and there's a lot of lobbying going on. But so uh, really this leads me to sort of ask what sort of dynamics you've got in the lake as a whole with other sectors and other members of commercial fishing that are outside your agreement. And so how do those 
wider decisions get made about how much can come out of the fishery all over, and then who gets what. So you have your fisheries agreement, for example, does that get some priority in the allocation of a fishery overall? Or is it not approached that way? Is, how do those kind of dynamics get managed? No, that's uh, a good question. It's quite complex, so I'll try to answer some of it, but some of it, you could spend probably a, a couple of days talking about it, um, but I won't put you through that. <laughs> um, so there's been some uh, court cases in Canada to kind of try and um, settle out some of those questions. And um, what the Canadian courts have said is that um, there is a priority for fishing. And the number one priority, uh, the courts have said, is for conservation. So that comes first. Um, what comes second uh, is supposed to be um, indigenous fisheries. And everybody else comes in after that. So there is a, a supposed to be a priority of, of fishing. Um, as far as how that works in the real world, I don't think it really always works out quite that way. Uh, the recreational fishers have a, a large uh, lobby and um, they put a lot of pressure to, to um, be able to continue some of their practices like fish stocking, for example, that we, we really don't want them to do because uh, it has a lot of negative effects. Um, but as far as the, the commercial fishing and the recreational fishing uh, in, in Ontario are looked at differently, and there really isn't much connection between the two. Um, the uh, amount of fish that can be taken recreationally has no, um, is it really, is it even hardly, it's, there's not much monitoring uh, of that. So how much fish are taken recreationally? We only have a very loose idea um, whereas with the commercial fishery, we have to keep very strict records of how much fish is, is being caught. Um, and as far as the allocation of that goes, um, a long time ago, um, the Ministry of Natural Resources divided the lake up into these different areas um, and said that, uh, you know, the fish in one area, uh, they don't swim elsewhere. Uh, they 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 know this this little uh, little sp they stay in this one spot, um, which is why we wanted to partly why we wanted to do this acoustic telemetry thing because we knew better, and we were uh, we needed to show them with their own technology that they were wrong and yeah well, they were wrong, um, and uh, so anyway um, the. Saugi and Ojibwe Nation are the only ones that fish commercially within this imaginary boundary. Um, but now that we've started to uh, demonstrate that uh, those fish don't recognize that there's an imaginary line in the water, um, we're going to have to have some more conversations because um, for some reason, those uh, the fish on the Saugi and Ojibwe Nation side of that imaginary line, there's a lot less of those fish than there are on the other side of that imaginary line where the um, the non saw uh, commercial fisheries are fishing. So uh, we have some work to do on uh, trying to resolve some of that. But uh, yeah, there's... <laughs> It's very complicated, uh, but yeah, I, don't, I won't spend any more time, I think, than that. Yeah, go ahead there. Bear Trump. So this is the uh, a very special place, like I said, because it has all that... Um, all that uh, history that stretches back um, thousands of years of f people coming here to fish. Um, and this is just an aerial view. I don't know, uh, Alex, do you show any of the, anything uh, from the ground to see some of the, 
Oh, okay, yeah. So you could just get a bit of an idea of the aerial view. But um, you can see how the shore is really uh, kind of rocky. If you were to walk that, you would find that uh, there's all these pits um, along the shoreline. And that's because um, Saab was going out and catching those fish and then bringing them back to those pits where, where the fish would be dried. Um, and like I said, there's, um, there's still, everything's still set up uh, w with the rocks and everything. And you can see where all the different um, uh, parts of the encampment were, where they had the fire, where they set up the tents, where everything, yeah, where everything was set up. So it's still set up there today. Um, and all it would really take is um, one person that went over to the island that, that had no clue of what was there, kicking some rocks around, and that would all actually all be gone. So it's a little, uh, it's a little nerve wracking in that perspective because. Yeah. So for someone that went there that didn't. Uh, know that history, they wouldn't know what they were looking at, and they might, uh, or, <laughs> yeah, they could damage and destroy it without even knowing that that is something that's thousands of years old. Yeah. I think I'm the last one. Um, I I do know that um, <clears throat> not only us as Indigenous peoples, um, well, for us as Māori anyway, when we um, come and when, when you know, when, if you want to know us, you also got to know where, who our tanifa is. And um, it's like a tanifa, if you don't know what a tanifa is, it's like our water guardian. So I have a tanifa, Ari Ari over there has a tanifa, she has a tanifa, and all Māori here should know their tanifa. We all know our, the names of our tanifa. Even Auntie over there from Fiji, she knows her tanifa too. So I'm just like saying, what's the name of your tanifa? Your water guardian. Women, women are responsible. That's they're the medicine. They're the Fair enough. women are the medicine people and the carriers of water. Um, that's the best way to put it. They're the res that's their responsibility, is the water, whereas the men's is responsible for the fire. Um, in in the Ojibwe teachings, that's that's the best way that I can put that. Yeah, there's there's a lot of specific ceremonies tied to water that that only women can do. We use copper cans and cups to hold the water and, and bless it and. You know, women, they have the, the sacred water within them when they're pregnant, and it's it's their responsibility. Um, yeah, there's a lot of really cool teachings and really cool songs from a lot of awesome uh, Nishnabe uh, women out there about the water. Uh, and they, they have a lot of water to deal with. We have a lot of water in the Great Lakes. And there's this one woman, Josephine Mandeman, she, she started this thing called the Water Walk. She started, she, she would fill up her copper can with water and walk around the Great Lakes, uh, raising awareness for the water. And sh she unfortunately passed, but that was a really powerful sort of initiative, and it really got a lot of people's eyes open to to water. And then there's also a, a young a young Anishinaabe lady, Autumn Peltier, I think her name is, uh, the water warrior, and she's younger than me, and she's doing a lot of really cool stuff, protecting the water and raising awareness. So our uh, our women are doing a good job. And I think uh, Buddy said we're, oh, yes, last one. I, I was told five minutes, but like Ryan said, if no one's pulling us off, yeah. Thank you. Just to wrap up, first of all, um, kia ora. Thank you so much. Um, ko Natalia Ho. Um, my question was, now that you guys are here, how, how are you going to move forward? Is there anything in the future that you are planning to cooperate with people from Aotearoa, New Zealand? Is there anything, what what would you think of the future if you now could just, I don't know, a few a few lines of um, tying tying your work and tying the work from all those awesome people here together? 
Well, we, we, what I've seen is we share a lot of the same issues and, and a lot of the same passion and, you know, we're all related and I think there's great opportunity to work together and just to, to improve our waters and our fisheries. Um, I've been really, really awe-inspired the last few days. It's been really wicked. A lot better than some of these academic society conferences I go to. Those are pretty lame. This one's like pretty deadly, so I'll let uh, Ryan speak to that. Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, we would be very much open to uh, continuing um, discussions um, and what that may look like, I don't know, but I, I for one am completely open to collaborating going on in the future. Um, like uh, Alex said, there seems to be so many um, so many similarities and kind of common issues. Um, and I think it makes sense that, uh, you know, that we can learn, continue to learn from each other. I know I've learned from being here over the last few days and we've, I'm sure we've only just barely scratched the surface. I, I still don't know half of what you're saying, so. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, yeah, I I um, I don't know. It's it's something that uh, I don't know what that might look like. But I I for one would be quite interested in continuing with uh, discussions. We'll put you all on a plane and fly out to Canada and have you jump in some cold water. <laughs> you sure? Do you want to have some words to close us off? Yeah. No, it's uh, I to answer your question. I, I believe that there's so many similarities between our, our cousins over here, um, and, and I and I graciously call you our cousins over here. Um, you know, in 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 our territories in Canada and the U.S., we call them our brothers and sisters. Unfortunately, you guys got to be cousins because you live so far away. <laughs> but it's still a good thing. And, and I think we have a lot to learn from each other um, and to be able to work with one another and, and bring that circle back as a whole um, and reunite those those fires of that of the what we call the eighth generation. It's going to be the eighth generation that relights that fire, that reunites and brings unity back into the world. And it's the generation, uh, it's actually Alex's generation and his uh, sister and, and that, it's that generation that's gonna reunite that fire as to our prophecies um, and to our teachings. And I think they're well on their way and I think we need to keep that encouragement up and, and keep that strength and, and unity up to encouraging the young ones to carry on. And you know, like I said, reunite that fire, relight it and bring unification back. Yeah, and we say uh, miigwech where we're from, which is thank you. And if we want to say a big thank you, we say chi miigwech. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so miigwech to you all. And I, that's, that concludes our circle. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. <laughs>